One of the things that I want to go through tonight is kind of um, from the beginning, the history of Seattle. And I know that it's like CSO's history of Seattle, but really Seattle has evolved in its decision making when it comes to um, the wastewater system. And really, as time has gone by from the 1800s to now, every decision that we've made really becomes a factor in how we decide to deal with CSOs in today's long-term uh, control plan. So to give you guys a little bit of history on where we're at, how we got here, and why you're having to think about the things you are as we're working through the long-term control plan is kind of the goal for tonight. Seattle is about 160 years old. Uh, this is a map of uh, 1891. And as you can see, uh, the neighborhoods are already starting to form in 1891. I think this one's pretty cool. But the thing to note about that, we're getting roadways. Um, and this picture fascinates me because that is a really well-maintained dirt road um, on First and Yesler uh, in 1884. It's amazing the infrastructure that we already had way back when. This is uh, South Lake Union, so if you think about it, right about where that big heart, uh, building is, is where Daniel's broiler is now. Uh, so that gives you a sense of things. And then downtown waterfront. So by 1889, we had 40,000 people in the city of Seattle. So I grew up in Walla Walla, uh, Washington. Uh, that was about 40,000 people. Um, and there were no public water systems or wastewater systems at that time. That's a lot of people with no, no formal infrastructure. I have a few questions that I threw in here. So anyone want to take a guess on what, in 1889, what would a couple of the big drivers that finally got the citizens of Seattle to go, we should probably start doing infrastructure. Um, what's that? Scent. Scent, smell, odors, control. That's part of it. Rain. rain. We get a lot of rain here. Absolutely. Starting to manage it. OK. Two biggest drivers. Lake Union, a typhoid outbreak in 1889. And then also a big fire. So you think about back to that picture that I pointed out where Daniel's broiler now is. Well, those were people's homes. They had no wastewater systems, pretty much flowing into Lake Union. And Lake Union was their drinking water as well. So that gives you a sense of the kind of environment that we were in back in 1889 for 40,000 people. And by the way, the city's gone, so we might as well rebuild it anyway with the fire. So that was the first big uh, push, 1880s to 1940s, um, to build our infrastructure. Um, and as you can see, here's a few pictures of, of uh, uh, construction going on. Also, the next picture, a few other. Uh, these are all wastewater infrastructure pictures from the 1800s to the 1920s, I think, is the latest. A large part of our infrastructure was built within the 20s. That was probably the biggest peak of construction of, of the wastewater system. But the interesting thing, if you notice this, that's a wastewater line, and that's Lake Union. So we were conveying it away from the houses much better. But really, we were still just getting it to the water body as fast as we possibly could. Because really, public health and safety in the homes were our biggest focus at that point in time. So every city, so here's the first decision that's going to weigh in as we walk through this. Every city has to make a choice. When they're building infrastructure, there's a couple different ways of doing it. You can build a separated system, which means in every roadway you put two pipes. One is connected to all the houses and takes all the wastewater and conveys it to wherever you're going to convey it. At this point in time, it was Lake Union or Lake Washington. And then you put a separate pipe that conveys all the stormwater to a different area. Or a lot of cities at this, at this point in time, in the early 1900s, made the choice to do combined systems. Combined systems was, were cheaper to build, a bigger pipe, but only one pipe that you had to put in the middle of the street, and it took everything. Took all the roadway runoff, took all the house runoff, roof drains were connected, everything into one pipe, and then it all got conveyed away. Cost effective to begin to, to build because it's one less bit of infrastructure, but different sets of issues that you have with it. So if you notice that for a combined system, 
What's going out into the lake, and what was going out to the lake at that time and during the storm, 90% of it is storm water, all the roadway runoff. Um, only about 10% of it is wastewater from the households. Um, and that's typically what we experience today. So the 1940s are here. We built all the infrastructure. We're good to go. We're carrying it, picking up everything off the streets and the, uh, and the houses, and we're conveying it away. And public and health and safety is getting much better. We're good to go, right? Well, maybe not. So in 1940, what was still missing as part of our system? Where does the waste go? <laughs> exactly. So we were really good at getting it to Lake Washington, Lake Union, and every place else. Um, but we weren't really treating it too much, at least centrally. We had point treatment at places, but we really needed to focus on getting it to a, a single point treatment. So the focus of the 50s and the 60s were to build the trunk system and start the treatment. <laughs> the treatment of the wastewater. So Metro was formed in 19, John? 1958. Um, and that's when we finally got a regional wastewater treatment facility. But we were still building combined systems, so it was so we would still be even with wastewater treatment. We were still experiencing overflows during large storm events, and that's what we're dealing with today. Still, before we had wastewater, this is Longfellow Creek, with the CSOs flowing right into the 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 uh, creek itself. So it wasn't just the large water bodies. We had our creeks that were also receiving overflows. Okay, we've got treatment now. We are, we're all good. Well, not so much. So if you look at the date in this, we started building infrastructure in the 1800s, late 1800s. <laughs> we're now getting into the 1960s, and the infrastructure's starting to get old. So we all of a sudden had to start thinking about things we hadn't thought about before, and that is, are we re rehabilitating the facilities and replacing them on the right schedule and understanding the condition of the pipes as they're growing older? This is, truly happened, a very large sinkhole, a failure of a, of a trunk main that was about 30 feet down. This is a huge hole. So in response to this, believe it or not, Seattle became one of the first cities, actually the first city in the United States to implement a CCTV, closed circuit television process for inspecting main lines. We were the first in the nation, and that was 1960. We developed and, and uh, crew members actually built the camera. Nothing like it before. Okay. Now we're starting to understand our system. We understand how it's aging and growing. We're good to go, right? Well, no. A new requirement comes along. So what federal act? There you go. Absolutely. And the Clean Water Act is the number one driver of how we manage our business today. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, the, the goals of it are, are absolutely perfect, making sure that we're taking care of it. And for the Clean Water Act, for when it became, uh, came down to municipalities, the first place they focused was combined sewer overflows, because that was the biggest culprit. Now, these are pictures. This is, says Cleveland, but we actually had in, um, in Seattle area, we had a creek catch on fire, Thornton Creek, during this time frame. So we had our problems, no doubt about it, and we needed to deal with it. Okay. So this is really where we started focusing on controlling overflows. So any guess on how much um, Seattle has spent to date on controlling CSOs? Any idea? So since... 1960, we've spent about $500 million, and we have gone from about 30 billion gallons of CSO overflow in a year to about 100 million. So we've come a long way. Um, the dilemma is, and you'll learn this a little bit more in the, in the uh, later part of this series, that last 20% is tough. 
<laughs> you know, it's the 80-20 rule. So we're out here, and we've, done, we've come a long way. And I'll kind of walk you through, you know, how we've gotten there. But really, the task of this group is to kind of help us review and give comment on how we think we need, what, what we need to implement to get this the rest of the way. Okay, $524 million. We call partial separation was a big push in the 70s, 70s, 80s, 70s. Um, partial separation, we call it, in that we went into a lot of areas of the city, a lot in the south, and we said, okay, maybe combined isn't such a good idea. Let's lay that other pipe that we didn't back in the 1800s and 1900s. So we went in and we laid a separate storm main right next to the, the combined system. We unhooked the, the roadway runoff. So all the inlets that you see on the curbs, um, we disconnected those and put them into the storm main. What we didn't do is we didn't go to every house and disconnect every downspout. So that's why we call it partially separated. And that's why those systems still have CSO issues today in some cases. Well, what we found after doing partial separation, the 80s came along and we started understanding better about what we were doing to the receiving water bodies and we realized that, well, maybe separation isn't such a good idea after all because where are all the pollutants, really? In the storm water. So we started rethinking it. Maybe separation wasn't the best idea. Maybe what we should do is try and get as much to the treatment plant as we could. So we started focusing on storage. So in the 80s, and somewhat in the 90s, we built a lot of very big storage facilities. And that's what that part is. And then retrofits, what you'll hear more about is, you know, the first thing is, can we do something in the system before we build anything bigger to get as much capacity out of it as we can? And we're always looking at ways to improve the system. Over that, you can see from the 80s, we went from uh, 400 million gallons to about one, 141 million gallons in 2008 to 2009. And the frequency, and you're going to hear more about this, what the criticalness of frequency is, we went from about 2,800 times a year, some wastewater would come out of some pipe um, in some water body, we're down to about 252. Where we need to be, and you'll hear more about this, is we have 90 outfalls. We need to be to one overflow per outfall per year. That's our target. OK. So history always creates a picture. And this is the dilemma that you're going to walk through with us. The technical folks are going to walk you through and say, here's what feas what's feasible, technically feasible and not, for any given basin. And it's the history that's created that technical feasibility. So if you look at this map, it's got three different colors on it. It's got the combined system, which is yellow, which means we didn't go back and do anything different than when we initially built it. It's, everything still goes into one pipe. The pink is where we went back later on and said, maybe we should separate. And we put storm mains in and disconnected the streets. And the, oh, sorry, pink is, sorry, green. Green is partially separated. And then the pink, if anyone lives north of 85th, you know what pink is. It's ditch and culvert, typically, for the, door, the drainage system, and then a sanitary-only line down the center of the street. All of these areas impact the CSOs, and all of these areas present different dilemmas for how we fix things. OK, so we're feeling pretty good. We're down to about a 400 million gallons. We think we went from three 30 billion gallons. We think we're doing pretty good. We got that CSOs handled. Is there someplace else we, sh we should be looking? And so in the 90s, we kind of refocused. And we said, where should we be focusing in the 90s? And really what we started to do is understand for the 90s, so how have we impacted the receiving water bodies? And how can we have bigger benefit or the biggest benefit within the receiving water bodies? And that's really what we focused on, SPU, within the 90s. Um, if anyone's been involved in the creeks, 
we did three major um, watershed plans. You know, what are the things that we can do to restore the, the creek health um, for Thornton, Longfellow, and Pipers? C Streets um, got its evolution in the 90s, um, barely in the 90s, I think it was like 98. Um, but this is how, where we started looking at different ways of dealing with storm water. How do we slow it down? How do we clean it? How do we reduce the impacts to receiving water bodies? Then the 2000s came and all of a sudden we started realizing it's like, man, we can't just keep adding project, different programs. We can't keep going back to the ratepayers and saying, and here's a new thing we want to do. And here's a new thing we got to do. We got to start stepping back and going, are we spending the ratepayer money in the right places? for the right reasons and prioritizing the right ways. And that's really what we focused on in the 2000s. Do we have the processes and the decision making processes in place to say, is a C Street the best right next thing to do? Or is it a CSO tank? Or is it a sewer rehabilitation? Or is it a flood problem? We had to come up with ways of being able to decide that. And that's what we really focused on in the, in the 2000s. But now we're back. And really for now, for SPU, for 2010 and beyond, at least until 2020, 25, our focus is how do we finish the job? How do we get to that one overflow per outfall per year for the CSOs? So here's where we're at. So the CSOs that we have that are out of compliance um, you'll see by, denoted by dots, and there's also the maps over here. Um, these have it, it shown in, is this frequency? So the bigger the dot, the more frequently it overflows. And we use frequency because really our target is one overflow per outfall per year. So the bigger the dot, the farther we are away from that. We're still regulated by the same thing that regulated us in the past, the Clean Water Act. Um, through that, it's called a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination, I can never say this very well, system permit. And we actually have two of them. But what we're going to be focusing on is the CSO. But we also have a permit for our stormwater as well. Won't be a focus of this group. So up until 19, uh, 2009, last year, we really worked very closely with ecology. Uh, Washington State Department of Ecology. So the Clean Water Act is a federal act. Um, it, it was mandated to um, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, to be the one to regulate to the Clean Water Act. In some states, they've chosen to delegate that authority. And that's true in Washington. So EPA looked at the Department of Ecology and say, Department of Ecology for the, for the state of Washington, you manage the Clean Water Act through the permits. And so up until last year, really who our main regulator was, uh, was the Department of Ecology. They regulated us through a uh, once every five year permit. Um, we'd set the standard, produce a report, what we thought we'd need to do for the next five years. It would be memorialized in a permit and that would, we'd be off again. Well, I would say that I was at a conference about three years ago, a CSO conference, and EPA stood up and you know, matter of factly said, we are here and we are going to get every city in the United States that has a combined system under a consent decree within the next five years. And that was, that was a policy decision that they made. So last year, EPA came and visited. And so we're in the process now of also working with EPA as well as Ecology on our next round of permits and also they've uh, let us know that they're, uh, they will be going through a consent decree process with us as well, which this long-term control plan will become part of. So what's a consent decree? Consent decree is a, a legal, it's through the Department of Justice. It's a legal document that pretty much sets what your contract is with the EPA that says you will deliver these products on these dates and there will be fines and penalties if you don't make those dates. So, so we step back and we say, okay, so let's look at the Clean Water Act a little bit better. And there's kind of two parts to it. Two parts of the Clean Water Act, which are enforced through the CSO policy, 
um, federal policy, and there's two parts to it, the nine minimum controls, and what I call the nine minimum controls are how well do you take care of your system? You know, are you doing proper maintenance and operations? Are you um, maximizing storage within your system? Are you getting as much as you can to the treatment facility? Those types of things. Pretty basic, how well do you manage your system? And then the other part of it is the long-term control plan, which is exact, exactly what you guys are here to help us review and give comment on, is what are you going to build between now and your end date for us, 2025, to get to that one overflow per outfall per year? That's what the long-term control plan is, a set of projects, CIP projects that we're going to build between now and 2025 to get to the one overflow per outfall per year. We expect to have that within a consent decree by 2011. What we're hoping is that this long-term control plan that you'll be working with us on will become the 15 to 20 um, permit as well as consent decree. Okay, so EPA in visiting us, taking a two-phased approach. They've already talked with us about the nine minimum controls. We're under a compliance order for that. We have a bunch of deliverables that we've had to do. Um, we're moving along on that. And we, as you know, are now in the process of doing the long-term control plan. So this is probably a little bit of a repeat. Um, but, you know, why, um, you know, the, I guess kind of the question comes down to why not just plug off the CSOs and push more to the, the treatment plant? We can't do that automatically because the goal is we don't want to back people up. Um, because if it doesn't come out the outfall and then we don't have the proper um, uh, infrastructure in place, we're at, we would back people up, and essentially people's basements would become our storage, and that's not what we want to do. Um, so, and we also have to protect the, the treatment plans. So really quick, you're going to learn a lot more about this in the fall, but this is what a system looks like. So you've got the main lines in the streets, you've got the houses and the roadway connected. Here's um, a pump station. Here's one of the alternatives that we'll be talking to you about, and this is a, a storage tank that essentially when it gets full, it just flows into here as opposed to going out the outfall. Um, these are all the alternatives that you want. The goal is to keep it from going out of there and get it to the treatment plant. That pretty, gets pretty simple. You know, at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is protect the, the water. I mean, it's the Clean Water Act is our driver. Um, you know, in Seattle, we love our water bodies. You know, and we want to um, protect the, the, the fish, wildlife, swimmers. That's the goal. The regulations are there, but we also realize it's the right thing to do as well. So we have 90 overflows, and that's what we're going to be talking about. The long-term control plan alternatives that you guys are going to be looking at, you're going to hear about it in a group of 10, 10 basins. Really, we have 90 outfalls. Um, some of them don't already hit the one overflow per outfall per year. So that's the good news. We do have a few, though, that don't. And, but we have bundles that we're going to be bundling them into solution sets. Um, some of the basins are side by side, and the, the solution that you implement for one can work for the next one over. Additionally, we're working with King County because this system was built as one, um, but we both operate. So really the goal is to come up with a solution set that's most cost effective for the region, not just the city of Seattle. So that's what we're hoping to do. We're working right now on a model with, the King, with King County so that we understand how the entire system works so that we can come up with the right solutions. And you'll be seeing those as well. So that's where we're at today. About 100 million gallons and 200 events is what we have to control. So you're going to see um, one of the questions that the team thought might come up is how do you decide which ones to start on first? Um, and what you're going to hear is we have two approaches. You guys are going to be working with us on what's the long-term control plan, which is essentially what we're going to build between 2016 and 2025. But we also have a set of what's called early action items that are going into our 2010 to 15 permit, which won't be part of the sounding board. Um, so the ones that are along those lines are Genesee, um, is an early action item. Our, our timeline to construct on that is 2012. So we're moving faster than what the sounding board can do right now. Um, Henderson is another one in the south, south Henderson, but North Henderson will be coming here. Windermere is another one. Um, but everything else, you'll be out there. EPA sets standards for how we prioritize 
And this is how it turned out. So the red are the highest, um, and that's why we're moving forward quickly with those and won't be part of the sounding board, but you guys will be helping us with all the rest of them, um, reviewing and giving comment on. So our 2010 plan, these are the ones that are the early action items, Windermere, Genesee, and Henderson. A lot of green, which you'll learn more about what the green alternatives are, um, as well as completing the long-term control plan. That's our commitment. Um, we plan on, by 2015, actually having 40 to 50% of that 100 million gallons controlled. That's our goal. So that, this is our destiny. And this is really what we're trying to be smart about. Um, we want to make sure that we are responsive to the Clean Water Act and the regulations, but we also want to make sure that we don't place such a burden on the, t uh, the ratepayers of Seattle um, that it becomes unbearable um, for, for the, the rate of construction. We, this is set and committed to within our plan amendment that we just set. This is what the long-term control plan is going to define, and we don't know yet if this is the expenditure. So if you look at it, the peak is about $34 million a year in CIP. But these are still up in the air. It really depends on the suite of alternatives that we pick and that are recommended um, for getting to that one overflow per outfall per year. And that's what you'll be helping us with. So mission critical for us when we're dealing with the EPA is, number one, we got to make sure EPA knows that we're committed to building. And that's why we're moving fast on a few and you guys won't be so involved. So build the confidence and then create a long-term control plan that they know and feel in their hearts that we can commit to and build. 